When a young man married a rich black woman for her money, he never could have guessed what she would do next. It was a quiet morning on the North Fork of the Long Island. Within a cold and empty courtroom stood two striking individuals. One, a young, handsome white man with ambition sparking in his eyes. The second, a stunning black woman who, even in her older years, held a sense of youth and grace that made it impossible to tell her age. Henry Wright stood in his best suit, an arrogant smile on his face as his soon-to-be wife, Nyla Thompson, stood across from him. She was fitted with a white lace gown, skin glittering with gold rings and chains worth far more than all of his assets combined. He felt as if he had just won the lottery. To the knowledge of no one, the two were just moments away from marrying. Henry was born and raised in Manhattan, the youngest in a family of five. His father, an extremely successful businessman by the name of Clark, had made a name for himself in New York years prior to the birth of his children. He had met his wife, Victoria Price, early on in his career when she was still an inspiring student at Columbia Law. Together, they took up his father's empire, steering it forward and expanding with the same vision that defined his father's legacy. After 10 years of marriage, Victoria fell pregnant with twins, Maya and Chloe, in 1995. Henry followed four years later in 1999, as the youngest and only boy, the love of his parents knew no bounds. He had never known life without money, and the word struggle was never part of his vocabulary. The three right children breezed through life in private academies. They had an abundance of tutors, coaches, and teachers at their disposal, all of whom dedicated their lives to ensuring the children's success while their parents worked tirelessly in the background. The girls followed in the footsteps of their mother, pursuing higher education and prestigious careers, while their little brother did all but nothing. Life, to him, was nothing but a game. By the time he was in high school, he was already partying excessively, hanging with the wrong crowd and ignoring what little responsibility he had. Homework was never completed, school never attended, and teachers always left belittled and disrespected. College was never in the question, as Henry had been told from a young age that he would not only be given a position at his father's company, but would eventually come to inherit it. Though he knew nothing of business or trade, he was happy to step into his father's footsteps. He often bragged about the opportunity, not to take pride in his father's business, but because an entire lifetime of success and wealth had been secured through no effort of his own. When Henry was just 18 years old, his father was arrested on several counts of tax fraud and became a prime suspect in several scandals that rocked the state of New York. As the police radioed their home that day, taking into custody not only Clark but all of his personal property, Henry was livid. He began to scream a number of profanities, claiming that his family's rights had been violated and his mother would destroy the police department's reputation. He demanded their names and badge numbers, but to no avail. For the first time in his life, Henry's commands fell on deaf ears, which only made him angrier. He watched as his father was placed into the back of a patrol car and continued to insult the officers convinced they were wrong and only out to get his family. But despite his many protests, Clark Wright was escorted to country jail and the home remained crowded with law enforcement for days to come. While Henry and his sisters were interrogated, they knew nothing of the claims that had come against their father. Victoria, on the other hand, refused to speak and demanded a lawyer before the officers could ask any further questions about her husband. Three years later, Clark Wright was sentenced to jail on counts of fraud, embezzlement, and money laundering. He was given 20 years, but given the fact that he was now 60 years old, it was essentially a life sentence. Victoria was given 8 years due to her role as an accomplice. Throughout the trial, many facts came to light that left the once proud family empire in shambles. The scandal had not only tainted the right name, but drained the once vast net worth that had accumulated over the years. In the wake of the downfall, Henry found himself facing a reality he had never anticipated. With the business dismantled and their luxurious lifestyle now non-existent, he was left with nothing but the bitter taste of his own entitled past. The life he had taken for granted had crumbled, and the world outside his privileged bubble awaited with challenges he wasn't prepared to face. Luckily, he had been left with a trust fund to fall back on, a grand sum of $2 million. But given his lack of financial knowledge, the money had disappeared within a few years by the time he was 22. The $2 million that once seemed substantial had dwindled away, consumed by reckless spending, lavish habits, and the pursuit of a lifestyle that now eluded him. 
As the last remnants of his safety net vanished, the threat of looming bills and an empty bank account left Henry scrambling. Facing the inevitable, Henry was left with no choice but to step into a world he had never once dared to observe. The ivory tower of his upbringing crumbled, and the man who once bragged about an inheritance without effort found himself humbled by the harsh truth of minimum wage. The transition was rough. Henry now grappled with the monotony of clocking in and out, the demanding nature of manual labor, and the experience of earning a wage that barely kept him afloat. Every shift was a reminder of his fall from grace, a descent into the gritty reality of the working class. Bitterness festered within him as he navigated a world where privilege was no longer a currency. The disdain for his newfound circumstances fueled a resentment that clearly simmered beneath the surface. The taste of poverty, once foreign to his palate, was now a horrible flavor he couldn't shake. Desperation led Henry down a path he never imagined. A calculated decision to marry for the financial stability he was now missing. Enter Nyla Thompson, a 67-year-old wealthy black businesswoman whose success was immeasurable. She was a native to Philadelphia, where her family had resided for generations. Henry had met her briefly at a party a few years prior. They had gotten along quite well. Henry, sharing his life story with Nyla, echoed her thoughts of wisdom. They bonded over their shared feelings of grief, Henry over the loss of his father and Nyla over the recent death of her husband. But as the night neared its end, they departed with no intention of seeing one another again. Several years passed, and as the struggles of Henry's new reality persisted, the memory of Nyla Thompson lingered in the back of his mind. The knowledge of her wealth and success became a guiding light in the darkness of his financial hardship. Henry made the decision to reach out to Nyla once more. He carefully crafted a message that created a narrative of loneliness and a longing for connection. He had grown comfortable with playing the sympathy card, casting himself as a victim of circumstances beyond his control. To his surprise, Nyla responded. Intrigued by the vulnerability in Henry's words, she agreed to meet him for coffee during one of her business trips to New York. As they sat across from each other in a quaint cafe, the contrast between their lives was stark. Henry with worn-out clothes and the look of weariness etched on his face, and Nyla, adorned in designer attire, glowing in confidence. The conversation flowed effortlessly, and Henry danced around the topic of his financial struggles, carefully choosing words that painted the picture of a man who had been dealt an unfair hand. For the first time in his life, he spoke little of himself, instead steering the dialogue towards Nyla's life and achievements in a subtle attempt at flattery. With admiration, he praised her resilience and tenacity in breaking barriers in a corporate world dominated by stereotypes. As the meetings continued, Henry began to strategically insert himself into Nyla's life, attending events and gatherings where he could showcase the charm and charisma he believed would win her over. He played the role of the attentive listener, nodding sympathetically at the challenges she faced as a successful black woman in a predominantly white business world run by men. Nyla, on the other hand, found herself intrigued by Henry's determination and seemingly genuine interest in her life. Unbeknownst to Henry, she had her own suspicions about his intentions, but decided to keep him at arm's length, enjoying the companionship he provided without having to fully commit. As the seasons changed, so did the dynamics of Henry and Nyla's unconventional partnership. Within a few months, Henry had left his job in fast food and ended the lease to his apartment. He took up residence in her penthouse overlooking the city, where the two kept one another company. They attended social events hand in hand, and while the whispers of high society speculated on their union, the truth remained guarded behind the polished image of a loving couple they presented to the world. A year had passed since that pivotal conversation in the cafe, and Henry now found himself grappling with an unspoken question. What was the next step in their relationship? Or better yet, what was the next step in his plan to secure her fortune? It was a quiet evening, the city lights shimmering outside the penthouse where they often retreated from the world. Over dinner, Henry broached a topic that remained untouched for the past year. He chose his words carefully as Nyla, sipping her wine with poise, shot him a knowing glance. Nyla, he began, searching her eyes for understanding. I've come to value the time we've spent together this past year. It's been life-changing. But... I find myself wondering about the future. Nyla, ever composed, regarded him with a steady gaze that encouraged him to continue. What is it that you're pondering about the future, Henry? He hesitated for a moment, taking a deep breath before answering with one phrase. Marriage. 
The word hung in the air as Nyla's eyes flickered with suspicion. Marriage is a significant step, Henry. What are you seeking? Security, stability, and the assurance of a future together with you, he responded. I love you, Nyla. Nyla's gaze remained fixed on him, her features unreadable. Security and stability, she repeated, her voice almost a whisper. Henry, there's something you need to know before we take this step. Henry's brows furrowed slightly as he leaned in. His curiosity peaked. What's on your mind? Nyla took a deep breath, her eyes holding a mixture of vulnerability and resolve. I was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer almost five years ago now. Time's not on my side, Henry. The revelation cast a sudden pall over the room. Henry felt a chill run down his spine as he processed the weight of Nyla's words. Nyla's eyes searched for understanding. Henry, I won't hold it against you if this changes things. It's a lot to take in, and I want you to make a decision with full awareness of what it entails. The news was devastating, but Henry felt a thrill. Now he wouldn't have to wait decades for the chance at her inheritance. But his excitement at the prospect of marrying a terminally ill woman remained carefully veiled beneath a sympathetic demeanor. Undeterred, he pressed on. Oh, Nyla, I'm so sorry. He reached for her hand and gave it a reassuring squeeze. But you're not a burden to me. It would be an honor to care for you. Your last wishes, your legacy. Let me be the one to carry them out. Let me be there for you in every way possible. After a small period of contemplation, Nyla gave him a small nod. Okay, if this is what you truly want, if you're willing to be there for me in sickness and health, then let's do it. Let's get married. Henry's eyes sparkled with faint joy as he enveloped Nyla in a warm embrace. The plans for the wedding were set into motion, and as the day approached, Henry continued to play the devoted fiancé, all the while concealing the true nature of his excitement. He couldn't believe that the day had finally come, that he was now standing in front of Nyla, a ring burning in his breast pocket as an officiant recited their marriage vows, as a kiss was exchanged and rings placed on fingers, the world outside the courtroom remained oblivious to the hidden agenda at play. In the following months, Nyla's health began to decline rapidly. The vibrant woman who once exuded strength and confidence was now a mere shadow of her former self. The terminal breast cancer took a toll on her body, and each day seemed to be a battle against time. Henry, playing the part of the doting husband, accompanied her to countless doctor's appointments, offering comfort and support while secretly counting down the days until he could claim the inheritance he so eagerly anticipated. The penthouse that once echoed with laughter and the clinking of glasses now bore witness to a failing heartbeat. Nyla's energy waned, and the once lively socialite was confined to her bed, her strength dwindling with each passing moment. Henry maintained this facade, all the while reveling in the knowledge that his patience was about to pay off. As Nyla's condition worsened, the facade of their loving marriage became harder to maintain. The strain of the charade weighed on the both of them. Henry struggled to conceal his impatience, while Nyla grappled with a mix of resignation and the desire for genuine companionship in her final days. One evening, after 11 months of marriage, Nyla summoned Henry to her bedside. She could feel the last of her strength leaving, as if her body was finally telling her it was time. Henry, she uttered weakly, her voice a fragile echo of the powerhouse it once was. Come, sit beside me. Reluctantly, Henry approached, his expression a careful mix of feigned concern and frustration. Let's not pretend any longer, Nyla said, her words sharp and pointed. I know why you entered my life, why you orchestrated this marriage. Your intentions are as transparent as the life we've been living. Henry, caught off guard by her directness, faltered for a moment before regaining his composure. Nyla, I don't know what you're talking about. I care for you deeply. A weary smile played on Nyla's lips as she reached for a small drawer in her bedside table. From it, she retrieved the carefully sealed envelope. Don't insult my intelligence, Henry. This is for you. She extended the envelope toward him. As he took it, he noticed the weight of her gaze bearing down on him. Open it when I'm gone, Nyla instructed, her eyes reflecting a mixture of resignation and the glimmer of defiance. With those final words, Nyla settled back against the pillows. Henry, fuming with anger and holding the envelope like a verdict, stood speechless. What's this? After everything I've done for you, he seethed. Her face remained calm, but her eyes danced with anticipation. I would argue that it's everything I've done for you, Henry. Face the truth and live with the consequences. 
he looked at her in disbelief before storming out of her home. In a moment of rage, he tore the envelope open and pulled out a stack of documents. On the first page were the words he had waited all these years to see, the last will and testament of Nyla Brooks Thompson. Henry skimmed through the will quickly, confirming what he already knew to be true. Nyla had played him, and he would be leaving the marriage with nothing but a divorce certificate to show for it. In those pages, it was revealed that Nyla's fortune was to be divided equally among her two sons and the few charities of her choice. But most damning yet was a small phrase that read, novel to be published after death. As Henry ventured further, he felt his heart plummet. He rummaged through the envelope and pulled out another stack of papers, this time a manuscript. His father's mugshot stared back at him, eyes empty and haunted. At the top of the cover was the title, The Dawnfall of the Right Empire, with Nihilus' signature sitting delicately at the bottom. When he flipped to the first page, he caught the sight of a small author note that said, In loving memory of my father. I miss you, Pops. Here is your justice. Henry spent the remainder of his evening reading Nyla's expose. In a shocking twist, he discovered that the Thompson and Wright families had been intertwined long before he had even known of Nyla. Her father, Devin, had been friends with Henry's grandfather, William Wright, since childhood. The two had grown up in the same circle, and by the time they were out of college, they had formed a partnership and began their first business endeavor. The first five years were extremely profitable, but as their company grew in size, so did the two men's disagreements. After a series of conflicts, Devon was eventually excused from his 20-year-long executive position in 1970. Nyla's novel went into great detail about the harassment and abuse her father experienced following his departure. Within the next few years, his professional reputation had been destroyed entirely as a result of the rights and the misinformation they had spared. In 1978, Devin Thompson had taken his own life at the young age of 48, having been completely robbed of everything he had built for himself and his legacy. Nyla had just graduated from Harvard Business School at the age of 28 when she was informed of her father's passing. From that day forward, she placed to restore honor to her family name and pursue justice for the wrongdoing inflicted upon her father. Nearly four decades later, Nyla, who had been keeping tabs on the Wright family, became aware of the shady and immoral practices being conducted under the guise of the business. True to her promise, she had gone out of her way to collect evidence over the course of several years, which she then handed over to the police. Soon after, they raided the family's home and arrested Clark and Victoria Wright for their involvement in the continuation of the family's illegal practices. The novel had been in the making for many years, even prior to Nyla meeting Henry. Their incidental meeting was like fate giving Nyla the final part she needed to complete it. And now, several chapters were dedicated to the young white male, who froze in horror at the realization that he, too, was being exposed, just like his father had been those few years prior. In the aftermath of the revelations, Henry's world crumbled once again. The inheritance he had schemed and plotted for slipped through his fingers like sand. The expose authored by Nyla had not only exposed the sins of the Wright family, but had also laid bare Henry's true intentions in their marriage. The public, unaware of his ulterior motives, now saw him for what he truly was, a man who, just like his father and grandfather, was willing to exploit the vulnerability of another for personal gain. As Henry grappled with the tarnished legacy of his family name and the repercussions of his actions, Nyla faced the final chapters of her life with a sense of closure. The exposure of the Wright family's misdeeds brought justice to her father's memory and allowed her to depart from the world with a semblance of peace. The truth had been unveiled, and the weight of her secrets had been lifted. In her last moments, Nyla found solace in the knowledge that her legacy would be one of justice and redemption. The novel she penned, her final act of defiance, would ensure that the right empire faced the consequences of its sins, even beyond her lifetime. After witnessing Henry's fall from grace, do you believe he deserves a second chance at redemption? Thanks for watching and until next time. Farewell for now, and may your adventures be filled with wonder and intrigue until our paths cross again.